five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. July 1969, 70% of today's Americans were not even born or were too young to remember this historic event. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And yet, most of us know those famous words and recognize these famous names. But there's a lot more about the Apollo missions author Charles Fishman bets you probably don't know. We always tell the moon story from the perspective of the astronauts, and, and, and that's totally understandable. But I wanted to tell the story of going to the moon from the perspective of the people back on Earth who had to do the work, because that's not a well-told story. Ordinary Americans rose to the occasion in this remarkable way, and they're the ones who got us to the moon. 410,000 ordinary Americans worked on the Apollo missions, and plenty of them had stories just waiting for this former Washington Post space reporter to tell. He's one of these great figures that is not actually well known in American history and should be. There's not a single book written about him. Fishman talks about that quirky Missourian, plus several other men and women working in this time of innovation on demand, brought on by this famous 1961 speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Hard was an understatement. We didn't have a rocket strong enough, a computer powerful enough, or spacesuits sturdy enough to send people to the moon. It all had to be dreamed up by Americans quickly. That is what is so impressive. A lot of work back on Earth was done by hand. We were racing the Russians to the moon with good reason, because there was a there was a huge global contest for countries to understand the difference between capitalism and authoritarianism, between democracy and communism. It's a fascinating conversation filled with Fishman's contagious excitement for all things space related. So this is really amazing. So that's a, that's a huge crater. Next in this first person one-on-one -on -one with Charles Fishman. I think you wrote in your book that you were eight when the Apollo mission? I was eight. Uh, at Apollo 11, and I was I was building you know Saturn V models and lunar module uh, models. I was really captured by the sort of little kid romance of space. You know mm -hmm. that 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 sound, flying to the moon sounds cool when you're eight years old. It sounds cool when you're 58 as well. You interviewed many many astronauts for this book. I and I, I certainly interviewed hundreds of people who worked on Apollo. I was less worried about astronauts. The 12 men who have walked on the moon have written 15 books among them. Just those 12 guys have 15 books, and they have sort of told their story. For, for me, the story I was interested in was the story of the people who got the astronauts to the moon. Mm -hmm. the, we always tell the moon story from the perspective of the astronauts, and that's totally understandable, and there's lots of astronauts in my book, but I wanted to tell the story of going to the moon from the perspective of the people back on Earth yeah. who had to do the work, because that's not a well-told story. And that's what's fun, because it's people that we all can kind of relate to, right? A because exactly. Ordinary Americans sort of rose to the occasion in this remarkable way, and and they're the ones who got us to the moon, right? The, the astronauts flew the spaceships, but they didn't build the spaceships. They didn't design the spaceships. They didn't imagine the spaceships and all the things that went along with it. And so that, too, is a great story. And the astronauts would be the first to tell you that that work was more important even than their own work. We're talking a lot of people, 410,000 people over the course of the it, mission? It's, it's kind of extraordinary. 410,000 people worked on 11 Apollo missions, 410,000 people working on 11 flights. And that was more people in, in, the, in the late 1960s than were fighting in Vietnam in three years of the war. So really, it was the largest, it's the largest undertaking by human beings ever in history that, that, that was not a war. 2.8 billion hours of work? You, you... I, I was able to, I 
that was a fun afternoon doing the math <laughs> to add up, <laughs> add up the total number of hours of work. What's more interesting in some ways is you take the total amount of work that was done and divide it by the total number of space flight hours. There were 2,500 hours of Apollo missions, about 100 days. Even that number is a little surprising. We don't think right. of the moon missions lasting 100 days because we have these little clips of the astronauts on the moon that last 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. But there were 11 missions, and some of them were quite long. A typical, the moon landing missions lasted eight, eight or nine or 10 days, depending on how long they were on the moon. For every hour of space flight, for every hour of flying to the moon, walking around, driving around, one million hours of work was done back on Earth. And a typical American works 100,000 hours in their entire career. So an hour of Apollo space flight required the equivalent of the entire work lives of 10 people. That's sort of mind-boggling. Imagine being allowed to do something for one hour that 10 people had worked their entire careers right. to get you ready to do. And then the next hour, 10, ten more, more people, people had worked yeah. their entire career. That sort of that level of intensity is, is almost unimaginable. And so that's what going to the moon required. It was really, really hard. Intensity, that's a good word, because I, I know when you in your book you talk a lot about how there was the standard of perfection. Things had to be figured out because one little slip could mean disaster. Right. Space is, space is an all new um, operating environment and I don't really think, obviously NASA and the astronauts and the, and the, and the companies that work in space um, today appreciate this and, and we learned it in the 1960s, but it's a very different environment. If a bolt wasn't in the right place on a B-52 bomber, to be honest, if 20 volt bolts weren't in the right place or weren't screwed in exactly correctly, the, the plane wasn't going to fall out of the air. But space is a much more unforgiving environment, and computers are much more unforgiving. There's a difference between a one and a zero in a computer program, and it often is all the difference in the world. And so that, that is what is so impressive. A lot of work back on Earth was done by hand. Mm -hmm. The spacesuits were sewed by hand. Uh, the the uh, parachutes were folded by hand. Uh, the wheels of the lunar rover were made of piano wire, and the piano wire was also woven by hand. And if any of that work wasn't done perfectly, then the spacesuit might not perform the way it needed to on the moon. There was a culture inside NASA in that era. The astronauts would go visit people in factories. They would do factory visits. And it sort of looked PR-y, but it really wasn't. When you go back and talk to some of those people who are still alive and, and also just read accounts of, of, of them talking about it from that era, what that did was remind, some of that, you know, every spacesuit was 21 layers. So you are nesting 21 layers of fabric, hand sewn, one inside the other, each having to be perfect. Those spacesuits were custom tailored to each astronaut. That's actually not exciting work. That's pretty tedious work, <laughs> right? right? Sure. It, has to, it has to be perfect. And the stress that has, you know, right. that it has, it has to, to be, be perfect, perfect. But it also is not thrilling moment to moment. Right. And so the visits of the astronauts really connected the work that was being done every day with real people and also with the mission itself. Like it, they obviously didn't want to put anybody in harm's way. The, the people building airplanes today don't want to put anybody in harm's way either. But there was this other part, which it was it wasn't just the astronauts, it was the reputation of the whole country relying on the, the quality and the diligence of that work. And having the astronauts go visit all of these factories was a way of saying thank you, was a way of reminding people that the people who are going to use this stuff actually knew that there were people out there making it. But it was also a way of sort of keeping up morale and mor reminding the folks doing the work where this stuff was going. You weren't yeah. just working on a little piece of this. This, this was part of a huge, important project. I, I love how you talk about LOL, the, <laughs> not laugh out loud, the, the little the, old lady. The little old lady. So the most amazing example of this sort of high-tech equipment that was made by hand is, in fact, the computer, 
uh, each of the spacecraft had a computer on board, the command module and the lunar module, and the computers were identical, but they were programmed differently because the command module flew to the moon and back, and the lunar module flew from orbit in the moon down to the moon and back. Um, so they needed to be programmed differently. Those computers were the smallest, fastest, most advanced computers that had ever been created at that moment. But we didn't actually have the technology to manufacture the circuitry. And so the wiring of the computers, the programming, was woven by hand, as you say, by, by women who got the nickname little old ladies, the <laughs> LOL ladies, um, in a factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. They weren't old. <laughs> Most of them were clearly in their 30s or 40s if you look at the pictures and watch the videos. And they were literally former textile workers. Every single one and zero in the spacecraft computer was woven by a woman with a needle attached to wire, getting the wire in the right place. And you, you were talking about how everything had to be perfect. If a single wire of that program was, was done incorrectly, was misrouted, the computer would not work right. That wasn't the memory for the computer. It was the actual programs being woven by hand by women sitting at looms in a factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. And so that's kind of, that's sort of mind boggling. The mm -hmm. most advanced computer ever created, a computer for a spaceship being woven by hand by women sitting at, at benches in a factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. So, but that's, that's for me, that was what was fun and, and, and completely captivating about the mission, about, the, about telling the story, is that you wouldn't believe that if it weren't true. It's kind of, it, it is kind of an amazing story. There was another man in your book, a Missourian, uh, Doc Draper, right? Yes, yes. There's, this, there's this wonderful character who came from Missouri. <laughs> I think he carried his Missouri roots with him, but he never actually lived back here. He went to his first two years of college in Missouri, and then he went to Stanford and got a full degree. Then with a group of friends, after graduating from Stanford in, in the early 1920s, he drove all the way across the country. Driving across the country in the early 1920s was itself an adventure. <laughs> and his friends went, as soon as they got to Boston, and visited Harvard, and he went and visited MIT. And he liked MIT so much that he got a second undergraduate degree from MIT, and he never left. He was a, an honest-to-God character, an absolute, genius of navigation. He's a legendary MIT professor, legendary inventor and engineer, and he invented the equipment that permitted what's called inertial navigation. Inertial navigation is where there's a series of gyroscopes and computers in an airplane or a submarine or, or a truck for that matter, and you tell them where you are to start with, and the gyroscopes sense every movement of the airplane or the submarine, and they keep track of it. And so they can navigate you without adding any additional information, without having a compass, without taking star sightings, without taking, there were no GPS signals, but without taking GPS signals. And so if you think about a nuclear submarine submerging and not coming up for weeks at a time, well, how would it know where it was under the ocean? You need inertial navigation. The sort of invention of inertial navigation, which Charles Stark Draper was responsible for, his team then went on to, in fact, design the systems that guided America's nuclear submarines. Uh, there were engineers from his group at MIT on the first uh, sub nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, that went underneath the North Pole. His team then was um, uh, tasked with designing the inertial navigation systems for nuclear weapons. Having done that, they had, d in fact, designed the basics for the tools that you would need to fly in space. And if you're going to fly in space, you want to be able to keep track of where you are all the time because you're moving at seven miles a second. And so uh, if you make a mistake, <laughs> you could miss the moon by a lot of miles just by sort of you know, not keeping track for a few minutes. Right. Uh, Dr. Draper was sort of, he, he's one of these great figures mm -hmm. that, that is not actually well known in American history and should be. There's not a single book written about him, 
but he really ran a group at MIT that was indispensable. And then his group was given uh, the task, was given the contract for designing the Apollo computers that flew the spaceships to the moon and to the surface of the moon, and for writing the computer programs for them, and, and, and providing all the navigation equipment to get the spaceships to the moon. So the, the moon mission version of the nuclear submarine or the nuclear missiles. And he really wanted to be on that spaceship. He was a funny guy. He was not just a genius and a great inventor. He was a ballroom dancer. Mm -hmm. Even in the middle of the race to the moon, he would go <laughs> uh, enter a ballroom dancing contest in Boston. And his first place awards are part of the collection of the Smithsonian. You know you're, you, you know you're somebody in the world <laughs> when the Smithsonian will accept your certificates for winning first ballroom. place in a ballroom <laughs> dancing contest. He was a pilot. Um, and he applied to be an astronaut, and he was quite serious. Um, not long after MIT was given the contract to design the computers and the navigation equipment, he wrote to the second in command of NASA, who had been a PhD student of his at MIT and then worked for him at MIT during World War II. Nice to have so, connections. Right, somebody, somebody <laughs> with a little oomph in both directions. And he said, um, nothing will create the right culture inside MIT to get this work done and to take it with exactly the seriousness with which we all need it taken, like me flying on that first mission and running the equipment, but also putting my life on the line yeah. to, uh, to make it happen. He was 60 years old. <laughs> and um, Not exactly. Well, what's interesting yeah. is that the letter contains a line saying he had sought out the physician, the, the, uh, the, the NASA doctor who actually chose the Mercury 7 astronauts, the first astronauts, and that guy said it was perfectly fine for him to go be an astronaut. <laughs> he's no dummy. <laughs> and he's no dummy. And, um, and actually, the head of NASA, Jim Webb, who was himself a brilliant manager, was very excited. Charles Draper was named in 1960 one of Time's Men of the Year. He was a prominent figure in those days. And Jim Webb was like, wow, this could be cool. We, to get this guy as an astronaut, and his two immediate deputies, including <laughs> the guy he wrote to, said, no, 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 no. No, we do not need famous people volunteering to be astronauts. That, that is going to be, that would be a free-for-all. That road to go down. We're going we're yeah. to keep control of the process, and we're going we're <laughs> to tell Doc Draper that where we need him is in Cambridge, watching over this project. Not learning to be, not learning to be an Apollo astronaut. Yeah, of all the stories that you found out through this research, was there one that you really loved, or one that that you really brought it home for you how immense this mission was? Well, you know, the fun of doing this book was that literally every single day there was a there you know there was a discovery, there was a story that they, they aren't. They aren't unknown stories because if they were unknown, I wouldn't have been able to find them. Right. But they're stories that are sort of lost to history. I remember um, I was chasing something to do with parachutes, and I don't even remember what question I was trying to answer. And I and I found this incredible, you know, 50, 55 year old story about the men and women who folded the Apollo parachutes. So again, the parachutes were stitched by hand. Each of the big parachutes was. 85 feet across, 7,200 square feet. So you think about a, a 2,500 square foot house is a pretty good size house. Each parachute was, the, was as big as the floor space in three houses. Um, then there were three of them, two million stitches in each parachute, uh, but made a very fine nylon fabric to be light. And in the US, any parachute that's going to have responsibility for human lives, people skydiving or, or spacecraft, some, some airplanes actually have parachutes now. You have to be licensed by the FAA to fold those. And they, they actually, hmm. they, they, they re-examine you every six months to make sure you're doing it right and know what you're doing. There were only three people in the whole country who had been trained and then licensed to fold Apollo parachutes, two uh, men and a woman in uh, California. And they were so important to NASA and to Apollo that NASA forbid the three of them to ride in the same car together <laughs> because they didn't want them injured in the same, they couldn't afford to have them injured in the same accident. Well, that's just a wonderful story. There's a, you know, we sent a car to the moon. Mm -hmm. We sent three cars. We sent a car three times to the moon, and it really changed the whole 
complexion, the whole texture of the moon mission. Because walking is hard on the moon, it's exhausting, and NASA had rules. Those, the first three missions didn't have a car. NASA had rules about how far the astronauts could get mm -hmm. from the, the lunar module, not much more than a mile. And so, and if you think about walking a mile, walking a mile isn't that hard, but walking a mile in a spacesuit is actually quite right. hard. And then you're supposed to do work when you get there. So the car really changed the range and ambition of the science you could do. You could pick five things you wanted to visit from Earth and say, we're going to go look at these five really interesting things. And then you could go do it. And you could also stop and say, wait a minute, that looks interesting. Let's take a little side trip and go visit that. And when you arrived, you weren't exhausted because right. you, you'd been riding. Well, the only reason we sent a car was because two General Motors engineers insisted that the astronauts would need a car. NASA had actually been developing lunar vehicles to send to the moon on these Apollo flights, but they were imagining, they were literally designing and they built prototypes of, of things that were the size of a Honda minivan. And then sort of somebody sort of did the math and said, we're going to need to launch a whole extra rocket just for the rover. And so instead of trying to reimagine that, NASA, NASA just canceled the, the rover development. And these two guys at General Motors, a guy named Sam Romano and a guy named Ferenc Pavlix, they said, the moon car is really important. The astronauts deserve a vehicle, and it's going to be a GM vehicle. And so for two years, two and a half years, they continued to work on developing a car using uh, General Motors money. They built a tiny little prototype, about 24 inches long, of the vehicle that they had designed that actually worked, was radio controlled. And they took it to Werner von Braun, who was the sort of legendary rocket pioneer at NASA. They took it to his office, and they hid in the corridor, and radio control drove the little lunar dune buggy, the lunar <laughs> jeep, into his office. And he was on the phone, and he was like, whoa, what's this? And he hung up, and then he poked his head out you know, into the corridor, which is just what they expected. And he said, what, 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 what's going on here? And they came in and said, you know, we, have, we work for GM. We've designed this this lunar vehicle, it only weighs 460 pounds, right? <laughs> the spare tire in a Honda Odyssey weighs all 460 pounds. <laughs> and it folds up like an origami. There's a little compartment in the lunar module. We have designed this vehicle to fit in that compartment. And we really think the astronauts, the last three missions, need, uh, need a car. That meeting, that little moment when they drove the, the, the model car into Werner von Braun's office, that happened in March 1969. So the first moon mission was just literally weeks away. All the moon equipment was designed and built and tested, and the astronauts had been training on it for months. So the idea that just weeks before the first moon launch, you were going to introduce this whole new, I mean, a, idea, it's, it's a yeah. kind of spaceship, really. Yeah. Um, was a little crazy, but Werner von Braun was absolutely captivated with it. And by by the end of 1969, uh, the the design team at General Motors uh, had gone from 10 people to 400, and Boeing won the contract to build it. And it, I, I I'm not sure we would have gone to the moon those last three times if they had just been walking around. People were were really like, okay, we're going back again. What are we doing this time? Mm -hmm. You know, and the rover. They literally went eight, ten miles away from the lunar module. They drove around those missions. They did three moonwalks, each of which lasted seven hours. Six forward. Sixty seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. Forty feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Great shadow. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Thirty seconds. Forward. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed.